unassailable, and uh, I've used it at universities ad nauseum, and everybody hides from the challenge of it. And, and I would debate anybody on that. Let me repeat, we the people do ordain. Whatever we ordain and create, we do not have to ask permission to change it. And that's exactly what our forefathers said, that we have the right, the sovereign right, to change our government in the future to satisfy our needs. That's the whole basis of what I've been doing for the last 25 years. Now, it's not hard, and of course I came out of the presidential election, uh, you'll enjoy this, because if you looked up at the gallery when uh, George Bush, uh, not George Bush, when Barack Obama was making his speech on jobs, if you looked up, remember they show the family gallery, they see his wife there, and she looks a little somber because obviously they're having a lot of problems within the White House. And so you look up there, did you recognize anybody else? I recognize Jim Emma, the head of General Electric. <coughs> What's he doing up in the family gallery? Making his speech? And the other guy, Steve Case, the guy that did AOL, he was up there. And so that's politics as usual. You take your big, your big financial backers and you keep them in the family. Show them a little kudo. You let them sleep in the, in the Lincoln bedroom. You know, that, that's politics as usual at that level. And so Emelt is the guy that Barack Obama put in charge of jobs. Now this is the guy that has chased more jobs from this country than any other CEO that I know of. And now he's in charge of jobs. Well, that's a joke. That's a the continuous joke of Obama. Joke. What he's in charge of is raising money for Obama to keep him as president. Because uh, I debated Obama, uh, took the color of the guy, and I don't mean color racially, I mean the color of the guy inside. And, uh, and I can tell you, nothing has changed. I voted for him. I was so happy, I jumped with joy. I was being, you know, I was being interviewed on Al Jazeera when the vote came in. Uh, and I jumped up in between the two anchors and said, oh my God, this is wonderful. Because I had hopes too, even though I knew better. <laughs> even though I knew better. But you always hope. That's why I'm an optimist. When people say, well, you got to go get 60 million votes. Well, you have to be an optimist to work your heart out to go get 60 million votes when the media won't even pay attention to you. So, uh, he got elected and, uh, and what he's done is just horrible. What he's, the worst thing he's done in my mind, and, and there's a lot, the worst thing he's done is shortly after he was uh, sworn into office, he made this statement, we won't look back. Remember? Yes. Well, I can't think of anything that's more diabolically injurious to a democracy. Absolutely. To tell the people, we don't look back. You know, we're in charge, we know what's going on, and we look forward. You need to look back. Anybody who understands history knows that you have to know history in order to go into the future. Otherwise, <coughs> you're condemned to repeat it. And what do you think is happening with the presidency? It's repeating George Bush. Yep. In fact, I, so I keep saying George Bush light, but other people say it's George Bush heavy. And it's true. We're spending more on the military industrial complex under Barack Obama than we did under George Bush. And I can give you, there's more investigation of whistleblowers, five times more under Barack Obama than there was under George Bush. So, and, and I could go into some other areas, but suffice it to say that with my background, it was easy for me to look at this and say, he's done a horrible disservice. And we've got to find a way to overcome that. And the, and the stuff is there. The stuff is there. We've got 10 years of scientists doing their homework to dispute the storyline of the American government and show that that is where the conspiracy is. So now we have to go through a device to have something actionable. That is, we got to turn the power of this over to you so that you can vote to get it enacted into law, a commission. And that's what this uh, Massachusetts initiative is all about. Now, we'll do it in Massachusetts, we'll do it in Oregon, we'll do it in Maine, we'll do it in California. We want to create, <coughs> essentially, a de facto national uh, initiative for a commission. I say de facto. Because all this commission would be able to do, it's not, when I say all, I mean that's a lot. This commission will be created 
It will have grand jury powers. It will be able to subpoena people and put them under oath. Now, for those of you that may not be all that experienced with politics, let me tell you, the way you catch criminals and politicians is through perjury. That's really what, what really d disturbs people. And so now what we have, we'll be able to put people under oath in our jurisdiction. So in Massachusetts, it's the law. If George Bush or Dick Cheney or anybody that we want, Steve Hadley, uh, Richard Pearl, you name them, all the neocons are within our gun sites. And they come to Massachusetts, they'll be subpoenaed. And we have a prime official case that they won't follow the subpoena, they'll skip town, we can arrest them. We can get we the local, local police with the subpoena to arrest them and hold them until they come and testify. Then we put them under oath. And then we ask them questions. You know something? The parallel for this, and you'll be surprised, the parallel for, for part of this, not all of it, was the uh, House uh, Un-American Activities Committee. That's the precedent I use to release the Pentagon Papers. So there's always a flip side to some event, the unintended consequences. So that's what's in this law. Now the other problem that we had in addition to setting up the commission with these powers, uh, and that's the reason why a lot of states, see, if you can only get them in Massachusetts, but now if you got it in Colorado, they can't go to Colorado. You can get them in California, they can't go to California. And the more states we get, and what we create is a joint powers agreement that any state can legislate to get it on. So once we get national visibility in getting it in two or three states, then all of a sudden the energy will, will just rise up. And other states that don't have the initiative can latch on to it and put forth their grand jury powers. But so you that, could, that requires those legislators to do that. That's right, where they don't have, but then again, you see, you don't know what the unintended consequences of this going public and giving people hope that, hey, there's an alternative to the crap we're getting out of Washington, and that is more action. So they would lobby their state legislature. Now, I know something about politicians. They're basically cowards. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> they are. Why won't they talk? I'm sure in the heart of hearts, there's several members of Congress that would love to latch on to the 9-11 stuff. But why, why jeopardize here again? They're going to make a public decision, a public announcement that could jeopardize the re-election. Why would they do that? But when it's safe, you know, politicians have a great knack. Put your finger in the air, find out where the crowd's going, and run to the head of the crowd. Otherwise, you can't be a leader unless you're leading the crowd. But they're always following the crowd. That, that's the artistry of it. And there's another artistry, you'll love it, is that, you know, a gifted politician gets elected and stays there for as long as they want. You know. Why? Because they can tell you to go to hell and make you look forward to the trick. <laughs> Politicians do all the time. And you got to wake up and say, hey, you're not going to tell me to go to hell again. Because when, when you get 70% of the American people that want single payer, and that means just using the government as the tool to collect the money, it doesn't have to be government control. You can set up devices. I, I had something in the campaign of it. We're going to work it out so that the stakeholders would have more say than, than the government politicians. But now what do we got? 70% of the American people wanted this right at the time the Congress voted, they call it Obamacare. It wasn't, it was Congressional Care, you name it, they were all in it together. And what it was is a subsidy to the insurance industry and big pharma. I was looking, my daughter brought to my attention the other, a couple weeks ago, she says, have you seen your, one of the, uh, your debates? And so she has her laptop, she runs it up to YouTube and puts it on. And there I am, three and a half years ago, pointing to these people and say, you people with your darn health care are doing nothing but providing a subsidy to the insurance industry. That was three years before they did it. <laughs> Makes me look pretty prescient. <laughs> But that's the situation we're in today. There is an answer, and the answer is not in Washington. The answer is not in the state <laughs> capital. The answer is with you, the people. And as I said earlier, I have unreserved faith in the people. And that is scientifically proven that the people can make a better decision than their leaders. And I mean scientifically proven. I won't go into it, but th there's no doubt about the majoritarian decision. Now there may be members of Congress